this is the first bird to ever testify in court. On May 13, 2015, police arrive at a home near Sand Lake, Michigan. Inside, they find the bodies of Marty and Glenna Durham. Marty had been shot five times, and Glenna was shot twice in the head but survived. After making a full recovery, Glenna told police that somebody had broken into their home before shooting them and fleeing. Marty's three children were going through things inside of his home when they found a manila envelope. Inside the envelope, they found suicide notes written by Glenna. Just a couple weeks before Marty's death, he received a phone call from a family member. The family member told him he had seen Marty's home in the foreclosure section of the newspaper. Marty had no idea about this as Glenna was the one that took over the bills, and she hid from him that they were facing foreclosure. Even after finding the suicide notes, Glenna still proclaimed she was innocent. That is, until Marty's parrot began reenacting the crime scene. The new owner noticed him arguing in two different voices, and the last thing he said was, <coughs> Glenna was put on trial for the attempted murder-suicide of Marty Durham, and Marty's parrot was the key witness. This is one of the scariest catfishing cases I have ever heard of, and if you have kids that are online, you should listen to this. This is Austin Lee Edwards, a Virginia cop who catfished a 15-year-old girl online before murdering her family and abducting her. Austin posed online as a 17-year-old boy and was trying to sexually extort the 15-year-old girl. But once he asked for a nude photo of her, she stopped all communication with him. On November 25th, Austin drove from Virginia where he lived to the girl's home in Riverside, California and murdered her mom and grandparents before setting the house on fire. He then kidnapped the girl. While trying to flee, Austin died by suicide from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Thankfully, the girl was found physically uninjured, but the trauma she now has to face is horrendous. What's absolutely crazy to me is that prior to this, Austin was a cop with the Virginia State Police. Upon being hired there, he disclosed in his application that in 2016, he voluntarily checked himself into a mental health facility to receive treatment. And without looking into it at all, the Virginia State Police hired him anyway. But what they didn't know was that Austin was completely lying to them. It wasn't voluntary at all. In fact, in 2016, he was actually detained by police under an emergency custody order after threatening to kill himself and his dad. The VSP has since stated that they were not aware of this, but if they were, they would not have hired him. To top it off, Austin had quit the VSP in late October, and right before the murders, he was hired as a deputy with the Washington County Sheriff's Office. And according to them, they contacted the VSP during Austin's hiring process, and they mentioned none of that. Both departments have since stated that there was no indication that Austin would do this. There were so many opportunities for this to possibly have been stopped, but it wasn't. So please be careful and remember this story if you have kids that are online. You just really never know. Would you kill your best friend for $9 million? In 2019, Denali Brimmer met a millionaire online named Tyler who offered her $9 million in exchange for evidence of her killing someone. Denali, who was 18 at the time, recruited four other teens to help her lure her friend, Cynthia Hoffman, to Thunderbird Falls in Alaska. Under the guise of a hiking trip, they then shot her in the back of the head and dumped her body in the river. She sent photos and videos of the crime, but never received any money. That's because Tyler never existed. His real name was Darren Chill Miller, a 21-year-old from Indiana. He then blackmailed Denali into sexually assaulting young girls, which led to her arrest and the discovery of evidence on her phone linking her to Cynthia's murder. On February 15th, she pled guilty to first-degree murder and now faces up to 99 years in prison. This could easily be one of the most haunting Polaroids I think I've ever seen. Now, the Polaroid was captured and then later developed after Jonah Sullivan went missing. It didn't take long for investigators, once they developed it, to realize the same thing that you're probably realizing. There's something in this picture. But before we get into it, if you are a fan of all things chilling, mysterious, and unexplained, please go check out my podcast, Creep Time the Podcast. Go click the link in my bio and you can listen on Spotify. Spotify or Apple. Now, to preface where the picture came from, Jonah was actually an explorer, and he would typically explore abandoned buildings, one of them being the Gershwin Schoolhouse, which was abandoned in the late 70s, and no one knew why, and he went in 1999. After he never came back, police went searching where they found the Polaroid camera, but not him. The final picture caught on the camera was eventually developed, which showed someone in the background near the desk. If you zoom into the picture, you would see that Jonah was not alone in that room. An attempt would be made to digitally enhance the picture, and this was the result. 
one of the scariest lockdown photos I have ever seen in my life. On April 16th, 2010, in Newcastle High School, they went into a lockdown procedure. Somebody comes over the intercom and they say that there are reports of a dangerous individual who's inside the school. When this happens, Angela Germain just stays in place. She stays in the girls' bathroom and she ends up sending this blurry photo to her friend Kelly and she's like, I've got to stay in here, oh my god. What she didn't realize was that when she sent that picture in the dimmed emergency lights of that bathroom, she had captured the intruder who was hiding behind the end stall. But by the time her friend even notices the face and tells teachers and police and they get to the bathroom, Angela was found stabbed more than 15 times, having later succumbed to those injuries. Because of Angela's final photo and two other witnesses in the school, they do make a composite sketch, but they would never find this person. The only thing that we have left is the final frame in her. These are the scariest serial killers from each state, part one. Up first is Nanny Doss from Alabama, also known as the Giggling Granny. She married five times and murdered four of her husbands, and the only one that survived was her first husband. She also poisoned 11 of her family members. Her first two victims were her children, who allegedly died from food poisoning. She got the nickname the Giggling Granny because she would always laugh at the crime she committed. She killed 11 people and is definitely the scariest serial killer from Alabama. Do you guys remember when that lady sued McDonald's because her coffee was too hot? The original Karen, if you will. Well, the actual story is actually really messed up. Stella Liebeck was an 81-year-old woman who pulled into a McDonald's drive through in Albuquerque to get coffee and other breakfast stuff with her grandson who was driving the car. He then pulled into a nearby parking lot so they could get all set up. The model of their car was too old to have cup holders, so Stella then put her coffee in between her thighs and removed the lid so that she could put sugar in. However, while doing this, the coffee then spilled onto her lap and Stella got extremely burned. And I'm not talking it was hot like it hurt her skin. She got legitimate third degree burns to her thighs, groin, and butt. She was wearing cotton sweatpants which fused to her skin and then she had to be hospitalized for eight days for skin grafting. After being released, she required in-home care for three weeks as well as two years of physical rehabilitation and permanent disfigurement from the scarring. Yes, she knew her coffee was hot, but who would expect that it would be that dangerously hot? Naturally, Stella reached out to McDonald's to get them to pay for her medical bills, which were about $20,000. McDonald's then countered with just $800. Left with no other choice, Stella then hired a personal injury lawyer to sue McDonald's for compensation. During this injury lawsuit, they find out that McDonald's was requiring their stores to keep their coffee at a 180 degree Fahrenheit temperature. That is like scalding hot. It is close to boiling, which is 212, I think. Over the last 10 years, 700 customers had filed complaints against McDonald's in their customer service department about burns they received from their hot coffee. Stella won almost $3 million in her lawsuit, but sadly, this was not the end. Obviously, this looks bad for McDonald's, so then they retaliate by starting a PR campaign to paint Stella as the poster child for excessive lawsuits. Stella is ridiculed on late night shows, she becomes a pariah in Albuquerque, and she even has to move houses because the harassment is so bad. This poor 81-year-old woman. Stella died in August 2004, 10 years after the settlement was reached. Her daughter said that the injury occurring so late in her life, as well as the court proceedings and negative press against her, virtually destroyed her mother's quality of life. Rather than take ownership, they basically ruined this lady's life. And if you're wondering, no, McDonald's has not lowered the serving temperature of their coffee. Instead, they just have a lot more warnings telling you how hot it is, so then you can't file a lawsuit in case you get burned. The Manson family. Charles Manson wanted to join a cult, but after looking over a few of them, he realized that they were a little bit too corrupt and crazy for his liking. So Charles would recruit over 100 people to join a cult of his creation, and this cult would be called the Manson family. Things would start out rather normal for the cult until one day on August 8th, 1969, Charles would order four of his members to go to the Hollywood Hills and kill actress Sharon Tate. He directed his followers to do it in the most brutal way possible. Sharon Tate was actually the spouse of very well-known director Roman Polanski, and she was carrying his child at the time. The four would break into the house and murder her along with four other people that were nearby. But the madness didn't end there. The very next day, a grocery store worker and his wife would also be killed by the Manson family. 
but thankfully though the madness would end there because a few days later Charles Manson along with a few other members of the Manson family would be arrested and sentenced to life in prison. It's a very wild case but this is the scariest video on the internet. This is Joseph D'Angelo Jr. who's also known as the original Night Stalker. He is an American serial killer who was also formerly a police officer who's been indicted on at least 13 murders, 120 robberies, and over 50 assaults on women. Listen how crazy this is. He would break into a house, tie the couple up, and he would take the male victim, put plates on top of the male victim, and would tell him that if any plate dropped that he would kill both of them. So now the male victim is laying down on his stomach and obviously he's scared and shaking so eventually one of the plates are going to fall anyway. Even creepier than that, if he found a woman that he wanted to assault, he would call the home phone before and after the incident took place. And the video you are going to hear is exactly that. This is from one of the victim's answering machines in the 1980s. After listening to this, I can honestly say, Do you ever feel sometimes like you might be a witch or be a descendant of the Salem witches? If so, take this witch test and see. Yes, you heard me right. During the Salem witch trials, there were witch tests that were given to the accused. If they failed, they were imprisoned or worse. One way they would see if you were a witch was the skin test, which wasn't much of a test. It just consisted of authorities looking over the accused to see if they had any moles, freckles, birthmarks, scars. Back in the day, this was proof that you were a witch. Imagine being thrown in jail because you got a mole or a freckle. These people were unhinged. The next test was the prayer test, which accused were made to recite prayers or a selection of scripture from memory. If they made any kind of error while they were reciting or heaven forbid forgot a part of the scripture, we got a witch on our hands. Another terrifying exam was the swimming and dunking test. Accused witches were bound at the wrists and ankles and dropped into a body of water. If they floated, they were guilty. If they sank, they were innocent, but obviously no longer with us. And I saved the worst for last, which was the witch cake test. This was where an accused witch was forced to bake a cake with her own urine in it, and then forced to feed it to a dog. And if the dog had any adverse side effects after eating the cake, she was a witch. I told you, unhinged. I can only speak for myself here, but I wouldn't pass. I got quite a few freckles, and I've been known to forget some scripture now and then. If you want to hear more about these tests and all about the Salem Witch Trials, check out the most recent Avery After Dark podcast episode. I cover it all, as well as some haunted spots in Salem. Do you think that you would pass the witch test? So I found something on the internet that most people have not seen. This is the only known photo of Cherie Glenn. This is a leaked booking photo. It's from like back in the 80s when she was one of the most famous cannibals in the US before she was caught by police. The reason the photo was leaked is because at the time, her appearance was considered so disturbing for most people that it was decided that they would conceal her booking photo as well as her interrogation footage. Even the nature of her crimes is not public information that was also sealed in the affidavit as it was described as highly grotesque and complex. Even today, there's not much public information that's known about where she's being held, and that leaked photo is the only image that has ever been seen of one of America's most terrifying women. Now that it's summertime, here are three of the scariest theme park accidents I've ever heard of. These stories are ordered to get more intense as it goes on, so if the first story is too much for you, then you probably don't want to stick around for the third. On June 21st, 2007, 13-year-old Caitlin Lassiter went to Six Flags of Kentucky. While she was here, she decided to go on the Superman drop ride. This is the kind of ride that lifts you up really high into the air and then it drops you down really fast. However, when their car got to the top, a cable snapped and became undone. This cable became wrapped around Caitlin's throat and feet. She was able to untangle the cord from around her neck, but she wasn't able to get to her feet before the ride dropped and both of her feet were pulled off. They were able to attach one, but she did end up becoming an amputee. On June 2nd, 2015, the Smiler roller coaster in the UK was having several problems and one of the test cars got stuck in the middle of the track. However, the employees hadn't communicated with each other that they had added a fifth car, so everyone thought there were four. So when they saw all four cars at the station ready to go, they assumed that the test was done. They then loaded a car full of passengers and sent it down the track, not realizing that a car was already sitting stationary in the middle. The car with passengers inside rear-ended the empty car, resulting in serious injuries. The two girls that were sitting in the front of the car had to have their legs amputated. 
And the horror of this was all made worse because it took emergency services four to five hours to reach them as everybody was sitting mangled on this roller coaster. The Verrucht water slide was the world's tallest water slide in August 2016 where our third accident happened. This water slide had an extremely steep drop and then a hill and three people would sit in each boat. The owner of the water park had actually self-insured this slide because it was too dangerous for any insurance company to take on. In August 2016, Caleb Schwab went to the water park with his family and the very first ride he wanted to go on was Verrucht. Caleb sat in the front and was too lightweight to weigh it down, so the ride went airborne. Then everyone watched in horror as the front of the slide impacted the metal safety railing that arched over the top of the slide. He flew out of the raft but hit the netting so hard that he was, you know. It was quick for Caleb but not for the crowd as they then had to watch the boat finish the ride as the water began to run red. A guest at the park physically restrained Caleb's mom so she couldn't walk over and see what happened. So the last image she has of her son is excited to go on the ride and stepping into the line. Tonight, a mystery deepening in Nevada with human remains discovered at Lake Mead four times since May, a body in a barrel. We're here finally tonight at Lake Mead. Lots of murders in this area, hundreds of bodies in the lake. These people who are searching for whatever they're searching for are like looking in the water for something. What? They pretend like, oh, oh. oh. kill. <laughs> Is there a body that you want us to find? Go right. No! We were literally just talking about the exam. We're about to find a body. Someone's out here and I'm all on and all we're in. Guys, dude. Go, 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 go. Dude, they were hunting us down. This abandoned asylum housed one of the most criminally insane serial killers in New England. Welcome to Connecticut Valley Hospital in Middletown, Connecticut. Opened in 1868, this was originally called the Connecticut General Hospital for the Insane. At its peak, the hospital housed 3,200 patients. Many patients here were subjected to extreme abuse and neglect, such as patients ingesting batteries, razors, and paper clips. One patient inserted pens into himself. But we're here to talk about murderer Amy Archer Gilligan. She was a nursing home proprietor and serial killer from Windsor, Connecticut. In 1919, she was charged guilty of murdering at least five people by poisoning them. One of her victims was her second husband, Michael. The others were residents of her nursing home. Studies and newfound evidence shows that she may have killed up to 60 people for life insurance money. She remained here until her death in 1962. I can confidently tell you that this is one of the scariest places that I've ever been in my life. This is John Lowe. In 2014, he was 82 years old and he shot and killed his partner and her daughter at his house in England. The house is known as the Keeper's Cottage Stud and it was actually a puppy farm because John Lowe was a puppy farmer. After John murdered his partner and her daughter, apparently he told the police that they had been quote, giving him shit all day and he also told them that they needed to be put down. This is an incredibly disturbing story and John Lowe actually died in prison a couple years ago. But what happened to the house? Well, after the murders and the convictions and everything, the house became abandoned. The house itself was tucked way back into a forest in England down a long dark road and back in 2019 I got to pay it a visit. Now just telling you guys that this place was creepy doesn't do it justice because this was definitely the heaviest feeling location I've ever visited as an urban explorer and paranormal investigator. I mean, the entire place was abandoned. All of the family's personal belongings were still in the home. There were shotgun shells that we found in the area. This is a picture that my friend Andrew and I took on the property at the time when we were filming our paranormal investigation. And we didn't know it at the time, but later we found out that this was John Lowe, the murderer's personal van. Now, inside of the house while we were investigating, we had so many bizarre things happen. Electromagnetic spikes, there's no power there, obviously. We had a mirror fall off the wall downstairs while we were upstairs. And the whole time we were hearing noises and we just felt like we were being watched. But that is not the reason why this place was so terrifying. While we were leaving and we took this photo, we were remarking how the woods around the house are just so creepy. It seemed like there could be a killer out there right then and there. And this is the craziest part. So we're walking back to our car. It's a long walk through the woods, like a 10, 15 minute walk. 
And right when we get back to the car, keep in mind we're way deep in the forest, we see a flashlight in the woods that we had just come from, like the area where the murder house is. And my friend Andrew points at the flashlight and says, it looks like that person's running because the flashlight was going like this. And as we watched it, the light began to grow and we realized that somebody had followed us through the forest and was literally running at us at full speed. In the video, it was like something out of a horror movie. We hopped in the car quick. Everybody was screaming. There were four people with us. And my friend Andrew tried to floor it, like floor his car, and he went forward a little bit and he hit a log in the road. I'm not even shitting you. And so he's sitting there going, mm -hmm. and we're all like, dude, you gotta go, you gotta go. And he's like, I can't move the damn car. We're like freaking out. And the flashlight guy is literally running at us at full speed. We can see him through the back window of the car. And just as the guy is about to reach our vehicle, he gets off the log and we speed off down the road. This was all captured on camera. It was so, it was just terrifying. But I actually just found out that they demolished this house a little while ago. Good riddance to it. That was an evil place. So much darkness there. But I just thought I would share this story because 